Hi, my name is David Felder. I'm an architect on the .NET team. And hi, my name is Justin. I'm a developer on the ASP.NET Core team. And today, we're going to talk about Project Type. All right, so let's talk about the problems that, that exist today when people or developers are trying to build microservice applications. Several questions tend to come up when you're developing these applications, like how do I build and run multiple services locally? I may have a microservice that um, rely, that consists of multiple services, like a front end and a back end API um, that I need to run on a single machine. Similarly, I may need to run things like Redis or some other dependency like MongoDB locally as well. How do I run those things together um, and have that all work locally easily? How do I debug those services? And when I'm running one service, it's pretty pretty easy to run my application and attach debugger. Um, what if I'm running two or three services? How do I get that whole end-to-end -end working so I can debug these services while running locally? Also, how do I do ser service discovery? So imagine I'm trying to I have services A, B, and C locally, or a backend and a front end and a cache. How do I get the address of those services when they run on my local machine? Um, how do I view logs for each service? Logging is super important in microservice applications and I want to be able to test my logs and see what they log in development so, I, so that when I'm, in, when I'm in production, I can look at an outage and figure out what's going on. And these are just a couple of questions, but there's several more that, that tend to come up when you're developing these microservice-based applications. Um, if you look at today's landscape in Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes world, um, or microservices world, you will there will be a camp of people who will get you to who will try to get you to use a cluster, lo either locally or remotely for development, um, because the idea is that that cluster tries to mirror your production environment locally. So um, that is pretty involved because it means that to do any kind of development with my microservices, the first step is to spin up a cluster, either locally using something like micro, micro K8, um, Docker desktop comes with Kubernetes, or you can use some other distribution of Kubernetes that is shrunk down to run on a single machine. Um, or I can provision my cluster in one of the clouds, Azure, GKE, um, Amazon, and I can, use, I can use my remote cluster as my development environment for microservices. So once I do that, I figure out how to get a cluster, I install the cluster, I have to get Docker and learn how to write Docker files. This is, remember, I'm trying to actually develop my application and run it locally to test these various things. I need to get a container registry. I need to learn how to write the Kubernetes manifest because I can't even, I have to deploy essentially to even run a simple application. Um, and then I can, use, I can use a tool like Scaffold, which actually tries to automate and build the building and pushing of container images and applying that change to um, Kubernetes. So the, the barrier here is really high because it, it requires me to, before I can do any kind of like development with multiple services, I need to provision a cluster so I actually have an environment that can actually give me features like service discovery and um, those, those, those things that I require when I'm trying to build microservices. Um, our solution is Product Tai. Um, tai is, is a tool chain that basically tries to give you enough of the features of Kubernetes, not all of them, but, but enough to do development. Um, so it provides a local orchestrator for development time. This is to offer, offer things like service discovery um, and, and a couple of other features that we'll show you as we, as we go by. Um, it also makes deploying microservices to Kubernetes pretty, pretty easy. Um, so we, we believe that a lot of the default experiences trying to go from my application to Kubernetes should be easy. And there are a lot of um, boilerplate and things we can infer from your project types without you having to describe in a manifest kind of a similar concept of a service and a deployment. Um, we believe we can automate kind of the, the, the getting started 90% of those cases. And then it allows .NET developers to use the existing tools. So you don't have to learn anything new. I don't have to learn Docker to run applications locally. I can kind of um, run my applications like normal locally without having to worry about um, a cluster or, or, or any new tools. And I only have to learn new tools when I opt into tr to trying to learn more of the stack. So let's get into a demo of Ty. The application we're using today is a simple app that has a front end and a back end. This is like a hello world scenario we can come up with that has two microservices. 
The front end will call into the back end to get some forecast information from the back end about some upcoming weather. Now at the command line, in the root of the directory, we can see that our app consists of these two services, a front end and a back end. These are two simple .NET apps that we created from basic .NET templates. Really nothing special going on here, except a few things that we'll describe in a bit. We'd like to be able to run this app in its entirety without having to deal with Docker containers, just two processes running locally. Typically, people solve this problem in the .NET world by either having a script that runs all your apps or by like configuring Visual Studio or VS Code to have multiple startup projects. Ty instead solves this with a single command called Ty run. This will run all of the services here and also do a few additional things. As you can see, both the front end and the back end are running. Also, Ty will start up a dashboard for you to look at all of your applications. The dashboard shows the entire topology of the application. It has some binding information, it has logs, it also mentions how many replicas and how many times each of these replicas have restarted, um, and also mentions some extra information. There's logs here that show the um, output of the application uh, for both the front end and the back end. This is just showing the binding information. Now if you actually click on one of these bindings, you actually go to the app. So the app here is the front end app, and this front end is actually calling into the back end to get this weather information. To prove that, we can go to the, the back end, and if we go to the right URI, uh, weather forecast, you'll actually see this, this JSON response that's being sent from the back end. So another thing that Ty solves is port conflicts. So these ports here at the very end of these, uh, these bindings for HTTP and HTTPS are all random. They're guaranteed to be random, and they're also guaranteed to be unused. So when you start a, an app up in Ty, you never need to worry about having a port to conflict. And especially when you grow the number of services that you run locally, this becomes a larger and larger problem. With that, there's a few interesting questions that come up. First, how did the front end actually know what the URI of the back end was? You can't just hard code it in the front end. You need to have some way to make it discoverable. So how do you actually implement service discovery in Ty? What Ty does is before each process starts, Ty will inject environment variables with a well-known scheme into each process that's starting, which includes both the binding information and or connection string based on the service. This allows each service to know about all other services. So when you execute Ty run, Ty will know which host name, port, and protocol is being used for each service, and it will inject these environment variables. For .NET apps, we also provided a configuration model, so if I go into VS Code and take a look at the front-end application, we can see that there's a method we added to this configuration model which gets the URI of the backend. This is effectively just parsing the environment variable we injected into the process to get the backend uh, URI. We also have a VS Code extension here. Um, if we go ahead and take a look at the Thai Explorer, that shows um, some extra information as well as making it easy to debug Thai applications. So if I click here, this would actually bring up the dashboard, but it actually takes a look at both the backend and frontend that are currently running. Let's go ahead and add a breakpoint to the backend and debug attached to it. Um, let's go ahead and add it inside of the backend and add it to one of the controllers. So what's going to happen here is when we send a request on the front end, it will actually cause this debug breakpoint to hit. So as you can see, it hit this break debug breakpoint. This shows just another element of why Ty is really useful for debugging multiple service applications. So in that demo, we saw a couple things. We saw that Ty can run all of our services locally. We saw that Ty can also get the address from the back end and the front end. We also saw that we don't really need to worry about anything with regards to conflicting hosts and port be ports because Ty handles all that for you. And finally, we also saw that dashboard that gave a really nice view of everything. Now, let's say we wanted to actually deploy this application to Kubernetes. As mentioned, deploying to Kubernetes isn't that easy. We need to add Docker files for both the front end and the back end. We would need to build each of these images, version each image every single time. We need to push them to a container registry like Docker Hub, author a Kubernetes manifest, and then I guess you should have profit after that. I think your app should be working. Some tools like Scaffold solve some of these problems, but not everything. With Ty though, a single command can get this application running on Kubernetes without any of that ceremony. To start, I'm going to use an empty Kubernetes cluster. If I do kubectl get services, you can see just Kubernetes is running in deployments. No deployments have been found. I'm going to run the command ty deploy 
and pass in this interactive flag. What this is going to do is it's going to prompt me any time I need some sort of um, configuration from the user. Um, so it's going to ask me for my container registry and I'm going to pass my Docker Hub account. At this point, what Ty is going to do is it's going to produce build output of each of your .NET applications. It's going to create a temporary Docker file to create the Docker image from. It's going to execute Docker build to create said Docker image. It will then push each of these images to your Docker Hub account. And finally, after all that's done, the Kubernetes manifests are going to be generated and it's going to specify your container registry and the container image name in there. Finally, it's going to actually apply that manifest to Kubernetes and make it so your application is available in Kubernetes. So now if we do kubectl get deployments, we can see that both the backend and frontend are available. And we do the same with services. We can see that both the backend and frontend have associated services as well. If we want to actually take a look at what the app looks like, we can do we can use the command kubectl port forward to the front end. Now if we go in the browser and go to port 5000, what we can see is the same front end app that we had running locally. I'm going to close that now. Um, another thing you may be wondering is how service discovery is handled on Kubernetes. So locally we had that environment variable injection that uh, injected the correct host and port name or uh, host and port into the application. Well, we do the same thing when we actually deploy these apps to Kubernetes. So if we do kubectl describe front uh, deployment front end, we're going to actually see a bunch of these environment variables that we saw locally being injected. So this naming scheme of service front end protocol eventually is used by the .NET application to build the URI. In Kubernetes, it ends up just being the DNS name of front end and back end for the um, for the, the host name that you need to use, as well as the port of 80. Now, before we, we spoke earlier about the steps you had to take to even run a Kubernetes cluster as your de development environment. Um, and when we think about Kubernetes, we think about the learning curve of, of having to even like get started where I want to develop a front end and a back end. And I'm supposed to kind of configure a cluster as my bare minimum so I can mimic my production environment. Um, the, the, the complexity is just, is just way too high for getting started. So with Ty, we actually believe that our goal is to not hide Kubernetes, but flatten the learning curve so that you only need to learn things that are relevant to your application at the right time. So whenever, so when I start off, I can use the tools that I'm used to for running, um, for debugging, for looking at logs, for compiling. Um, I can very simply get service discovery and a, and a bunch of core microservice features without having to learn the entire um, Kubernetes ecosystem um, and patterns all at once. And then gradually, as you get more comfortable with, the, with those tools, you can grow up um, gradually into learning more and more about the stack and you can get more control. So Ty kind of smoothens that, that learning curve from development all the way through to deployment. So we showed you a super basic application with Ty, front end and the back end. Um, but we also have a, a bunch more features that are, that, are, that are in the realm of trying to help you develop microservices faster. Um, so you can just, so as you saw before, you can discover your pair services via configuration. We inject the right variables, and then you can read them in your application. Um, we have uh, support for developing across multiple repositories. So let's say you have service A, B, and C, and you need A, B, and C to develop locally, but A, B, and C are in different repositories. I can actually run a command to clone A, B, and C, pull them down, um, pull it together into a single type manifest and run those. And I get the same features of service, service discovery and other things like that. Um, Ty has support for modeling ingress as well. Um, the intent being that it isn't, it isn't to say that, that, that you, that you would actually model your entire application with Ty, but I can, I can model a couple of core concepts like ingress so I can map specific routes, um, to specific services. And I have a, a, a local proxy that runs um, on, on my local environment before I deploy. Um, so I can actually test to see how routes flow into other services. Um, and then I can actually deploy Ingress and it will preserve those rules all the way to Kubernetes. Um, I can use Docker for dependencies. So I can list, 
as you saw in my in the demo, you saw containers, you saw sorry, you saw the the applications as services. I can actually depend on other containers um, like Redis or or MongoDB um, as part of my application, and I can actually get um, use service discovery. The same discovery I used before for other services also work for um, container dependencies. Um, hot reload, what we call watch support. I can kind of put tie into a watch mode where it runs forever um, for an application. And I can change the application bits without having to um, recompile and rebuild manually. Um, and then we, we want, we support this thing called sidecars. So sidecars are, are a pattern made popular by Kubernetes. Um, we can integrate with things like um, the Elk stack. So, so we want to build recipes for for common microservice patterns. So let's say I have um, a bunch of infrastructure provisioned by my ITR ops people. I can um, model that same integration locally in my Thai manifest for, for, for development. Um, so it matches my production experience. And then I can generate Kubernetes manifest and Docker files for services. So let's say I actually want to use Thai, but I don't want to actually use it for deployment. I don't want to go all the way. I can generate the manifest um, that Thai will use uh, to go to those services. I can um, generate those and check it into source control, for example, if you're doing GitOps. So it's pretty powerful. Um, the thing we didn't talk about um, intentionally was Docker Compose. Compose does solve a bunch of these problems, but we believe the learning curve is too steep because Docker Compose requires containers to begin with, right? It does have really great features. It, it does solve a bunch of the same problems that, that we believe. We believe that Docker is great for dependencies, um, but the learning curve to having, having to package your own services as, as containers before you get started is too big of, a, of, of an issue, um, too, too big of a learning curve for most people. Um, our customers, we, we think, um, would prefer the smooth on-ramp where you are using your tools to begin with, and then you can learn containers, and then you can learn um, Kubernetes as you care about um, that, that curve, as you care about more, more of the stack. So here's Compose. Where, and where we think it fits on the spectrum. Now, it isn't, it isn't to say that Compose is hard to, hard to learn, um, but if you aren't concerned with containers as yet and you're just trying to, to run multiple services, you, you're met with that complexity up front. Um, so you can see Compose is somewhere in between Thai and Kubernetes in complexity, but it does work very well for, for the same kinds of tasks. Okay, so future of Thai, um, we believe Thai is useful in general. Um, so, and, and through our customer research, we've seen people using JavaScript front ends with .NET backends and Python for ML workloads in the same application. So, we, so we're seeing polyglot services appear um, even for even for .NET, .NET developers. So we think it would be interesting to support multiple languages with Thai. And then we want to do more Kubernetes integration. So for example, we want to have a recipe for HTTPS. So imagine you, I could have an HTTPS um, enabled environment locally. And then when I deploy, we would configure a cert manager, um, let's encrypt um, cert rotations, those kind of things. We, we want to have those end-to-ends um, working from development and, and when you deploy. So I can model my environment and test it locally and test it in production, or, or at least in after deployment. Um, we want to model a bunch more microservice patterns and primitives. What I mean by that is Kubernetes made a bunch of patterns very popular. Like sidecars is kind of a, a, is one that comes to mind. Um, the idea of a sidecar container and a pod um, are patterns that happen to have been created by Kubernetes, but have become kind of patterns that that are now used by industry to do different things. Um, we want to model um, the ones that we can. So, that, so I can run those and, and test those locally and also have, have those models um, persist in production. Um, and then we want to have more integrations with CNCF projects. So for example, um, I was trying to run Envoy as a sidecar um, in my local environment. And that isn't something that actually is, is, well, is well described or, described or defined. It's normally um, for Kubernetes only. And I think we want to be able to, to model more of those and more, more of those things as, as um, time progresses. 
um, we have a booth at the a virtual booth at the conference. So come check it out and learn about more what, what Microsoft is doing with Kubernetes. Thanks a lot.